Hello everyone, today we talk about the first uh, North Italian lordships. Um, so we are talking essentially about the 13th century, the second half of the 13th century, communal Italy. And this is a topic which I have always found extremely interesting and I also realized that it's um, relatively less known in popular culture. Let's say that Italy has become famous in, in, in popular culture, especially for uh, the late lordships, like 15th and 16th century um, um, Italian regional states and all the major families from the, the Medici, the Sforza, uh, etc. Even uh, in the Papal States, think about how much has been uh, produced about the Borgia and, and all. So um, this um, um, has been, and, and telling the truth, um, I like that history, but compared to the previous one, the one in the 13th and 14th centuries, uh, I found it ra rather boring and I could even uh, objectivize the reason uh, why it is so, and not just <laughs> an opinion of mine, because indeed, even from a strictly historical point of view, uh, the age of signories or signoria in, in, in Italian um, and in, in, in late medieval Italy were definitely also um, crystallizing society. Um, the 13th and 14th century uh, have um, a lot more of sources coming from the commoners, from the middle classes that observed um, the uh, really th that were still involved into the uh, political life of the city states, and that had not been marginalized by the rise of um, a seigniory of a, of, a, of a lord. So um, um, today I, I take the chance to introduce a bit the, the period and talk about uh, these three main um, political um, figures of, um, of Northern Italy that are really um, the, the, what are conventionally named as um, the first uh, signori in Italy. And also, this term is very um, should be uh, a bit explained because, first of all, they um, um, they wouldn't um, you know the idea of a lordship is something uh, that is present throughout the world Middle Ages. I mean, uh, lordships are born in in in, in the very moment in which uh, uh, the, the late Roman uh, Dominus became an early medieval <laughs> lord, and that's that's um, or, or a Germanic chieftain. It's, uh, it's exactly the same. Um, we talk mainly about lordships in Italy in this and in communal Italy because we want to stress the um, the fact that. Um, um, popular or at least republican regimes eventually were transformed into um, lordships. Sometimes not even formally think about um, Florence that kept so much this idea of republicanism, of of, of a popular government, but the, the Medici basically um, li and then literally bought the whole city from the top of their financial overwhelming power. Uh, but this comes later and, and the first signori indeed wouldn't be even called and they wouldn't be called them um, not even by themselves as such because really these figures were uh, were really um, sometimes even called to to um, to call uh, to to play those uh, political roles and sometimes these roles were not institutionalized. It means that power was entrusted to them, quite often for the sake of military defense of the city or pacification, at least internally. Um, and it would still play uh, on the, um, uh, let's say, respecting the rules and the laws of, of the singular cities. Then today, with uh, Ezzelino da Romano, Alberto Pelavicino, and uh, William VII of, of Montferrat, <coughs> We will see how, um, obviously, the, the situation was um, much more variegated, differentiated, but um, this is how they really started on average. So giving a bit of, a bit of background to uh, 13th century Northern Italy, 
we have to really explain why, first of all, the lordships began to affirm themselves there. Well, to make the long story short, then we will go eventually in a bit more in depth, um, essentially Northern Italy had seen the um, quickest rise of, of, of communal um, um, civilization, we can call it this way, um, and um, <coughs> consequently um, uh, they also came first to its crisis, while for instance in Tuscany uh, the, the whole thing was shifted of like uh, half of a century. Eventually the fate um, was the same, um, at least in some measure, but let's say that, that in Lombardy these things started to occur um, by the, um, the let's say, the already um, the, the first half of the 13th century, as we will see, but then they would especially develop in, in the second half. Um, <coughs> while uh, while in central Italy it was a bit different because there were areas. By the way, how do we really differentiate um, the lords of uh, communal Italy from the lords that existed in Italy as feudal lords? Because Italy had feudalism, um, definitely, and quite often these feudal lords played both, um, the mm, politically speaking, both in the countryside where they usually stand from and they owned the m at least the majority of their possessions and into the city. It obviously was tied to the countryside, I if anything for, for logistical reasons, because the city didn't fit it <laughs> itself just through trade, um, uh, agricultural, uh, agriculture uh, at close range was the only way you could feed, especially this enormously um, um, large um, urban populations like the, the ones in, in, in northern and central Italy at the time. Um, <coughs> but um, the um, the process was very um, uh, the passage from m popular um, from the people, let's say, uh, regimes to the seigneurial ones was uh, quite progressive, and every city has a bit of its own story. Um, why am I talking about people's regimes and what what it means? Well, in Italian, the so-called popolo, and the people. Um, was essentially the, um, the the citizen population that uh, didn't belong to the aristocracy, or better, this is also an approximation, who didn't belong to the knightly class that were the milites, originally speaking. Now, in Italy, the problem is that um, the knightly class was, uh, from the very beginning, a sensual class. It, w it didn't stem... Uh <coughs> if not mythically or most of the times from uh, the ancient um, European Carolingian um, uh, nobility. Um, but let's say that during the 12th century the, the milites, the knights, had um, practically dominated the cities and subjugated the people. Um, and at a certain point the popular classes managed, especially during um, um, the <coughs> the half of after the half of the 13th century to sometimes even ban the milites as such um, and uh, essentially replacing them with their own aristocracy because the, the people at this point was growing extremely wealthy and that was the reason why they, they had even the material means to kick out the milites uh, at a certain point that came back to the countryside most of the times waging war to the city and this is the very mm, context in which we have to see the rise of the uh, first Italian seigneuries. Um, and it would mm, have this kind of popular uh, knightly class in turn. Uh, so it's a bit complicated, I know, but really the dynamics uh, on average are a bit... Um, are really this ones. And when we're talking about this, we're talking also and obviously about most um, um, urbanized and, and developed areas of Italy that were Lombardy and Tuscany at the time. Other areas had uh, communes as well. Um, uh, there would be communes even in, in, in part of the Kingdom of Sicily at this point because there were areas of central Italy that, um, that the uh, southern rulers encompassed. But generally speaking we're talking about center and especially northern Italy. 
but there would be areas, in fact, as I was saying, uh, especially along the Apennines, in the more uh, mountainous areas, areas where uh, the old feudal um, um, aristocracy had retained more power, or um, think even about the northeast of Italy, or the um, or even the northwest, uh, so Veneto and Piedmont, respectively. Um, and also especially the far northeast of Italy that was were um, quite highly um, um, and there were uh, cultures quite influenced by the French and German feudalism uh, even in the um, political and social organization the lands like uh, Friuli or Friul in German are were m much similar to places like Austria for instance um, and as well as many Piedmontese lords, uh, ex excluding Savoy, were, were practically French, were quite similar to the French. Um, and today we will see how, in fact, these major, um, these first lordships originated essentially from the, um, the communal world of these uh, areas, of uh, the most urbanized ones in Lombardy, uh, and the wealthiest ones. And the real problem in here is that when the people uh, are reached uh, uh, the top mm, and the power, they discovered that it, they weren't much good for politics and, and war. Because the militants had really oppressed the people, but at least were a military class, who knew uh, its own business, who knew how to build up um, solid territorial uh, do uh, dominions. The people instead were driven essentially by a sort of pacifist idea for which, the being largely merchants, they didn't want to, first of all, to go to war, and this would trigger in part the rise of mercenaries, but especially they wanted to um, to rule the city, but kind of um, uh, um, saving on the military side, and especially they weren't military men themselves. Some of them, as, as I was saying, were <coughs> were had come into the military aristocracy, and uh, there would be a, a substantial um, um, knightly class among the peoples, but their philosophy was much more different from the old militants, who were all really about war, and even though they, they knew how to make war to, to accumulate wealth and to invest it um, in their domains, at least they um, they had a broader they had broader horizons that often also encompassed um, international politics. Usually, the people, in fact, was wealth, and in the second half of the 13th century. Uh, the Ghibellines had lost, basically, uh, uh, in, in Italy against uh, the, the Angevins and the French, the Guelphs, the, the, the Pope, <laughs> all these put together. And uh, in this sense, the old militants were a bit more tied to the old imperial um, hierarchy. So, so most of them would be of Ghibelline origin. Not all of them, and, and you have also to think that, that Ghibellines and Guelphs in this sense was a bit more uh, of an excuse. Uh, really, um, the, the two sides being uh, uncompatible with all the <laughs> thousands of sides that, that a singular um, uh, family had, or um, or, or or any other person involved in politics could could take according to the situation because here think about how fragmented politically uh, Italy was and how this would increase the complexity of um, uh, of, of the whole situation and the problem of the people at this point was that it it wasn't it, it acknowledged that. Um, it wasn't a they weren't able to manage um, uh, effectively the uh, politics but especially the warfare of uh, of the communes and um, and especially that their contrasts because eventually the people yeah they kicked out the uh, the knights but um, basically as soon as they got rid of their common enemy they split into other factions and began to fight against each other and the main problem is that both the old knights and um, other um, communes and cities and um, and even other political actors that could came even from abroad began to play 
on these uh, factional um, conflict um, and, and to regenerate it con constantly so this would burn a lot of resources it would weaken the city it would put it in danger and this is the reason why many people um, excuse me many popular regimes uh, decided to call uh, temporarily theoretically um, um, a sort of um, a ruler we can say I think it's a good term in English to describe uh, the first laws in this sense um, and to to make them organize the situation now the the the, com the Italian communes at this point had already figures that were similar to the lords at least to the to, to the early lords that were the so-called podesta that were um, uh, certain public officers that um, for the sake of impartiality were um, uh, were drawn from foreign um, cities the Italians at this time considering foreign uh, not who was not Italian but who came from another city just for telling you how uh, municipal you know um, uh, the, what was the, the municipal mind of these people um, and, and it was a system that worked because the Podesta by the way weren't just civil um, administrators versed into the admin um, you know in law and um, and other bureaucracy affairs. Um, on the contrary, normally the local um, government would retain its own um, management of uh, the internal councils, councils and so on. But the Podesta were called mainly as military leaders. And this is very interesting because um, um, this tells you, by the way, how warfare and the need for uh, skilled professional commanders was uh, already kicking in in Italy um, and these uh, certain Podesta were um, extraordinary figures at this point they were um, they really made a, um, a living out of it like they, they could be employed usually the Podesta m w was in charge for either six months or one year um, sometimes m even more years in, in a row depending on uh, depending on the political situation um, and uh, poli local ties because obviously the, these Podesta had uh, they had to be impartial but as a matter of fact they weren't because all the uh, local citizen factions would would kind of um, com compete to, to to win them from from their side but usually sp actually th th these institutional figures worked to make the city going on and at a certain point to stop working Hence, uh, the uh, the communal governments uh, began to call for other figures that were chosen in this sense as um, as military um, leaders or at least people who were who had a great political weight uh, from their own wealth and properties, and we don't have to be surprised that these. Um, Lords would be drawn from the same uh, knightly class that had been kicked out by the people because they re they had realized the mistake of having expelled from their own cities the, the only ones who could make the city be um, feared and aggressive militarily speaking against the surrounding rivals um, and uh, there is a bit of, I mean said like this it, it sounds as if the, these cities were a bit schizophrenic and really the, the popular governments were a bit like these because for every factional clash that could happen um, this situation could really reverse quite quickly and uh, political instability is also another key word to understand this this point um, and, and uh, I, I always find it fascinating because we live in, in a moment today in which um, political and military analysis uh, in the world are done uh, with, a, with, a, with a satisfactory degree of reliability not beyond three months it w which means that in three months our world can really change uh, very, um, very radically 
um, and we live in a world that is relatively stable. Now, now imagine of living in in in, in this context um, in 13th century Italy, where every city is a state on its own and it's in continuous um, war uh, with the surrounding neighbors, and it's involved into the uh, international clashes between the empire and the and and France and papacy, you know, and all. Um, the um, all the interests that were at this time, Italy wasn't um, you know a flat ground with a, with a kind of a thermic death approaching like other underdeveloped areas of the world. Uh, this was um, probably the well. It was definitely the wealthiest um, place in the world at the time. And think about all the European trade and how Italian bankers uh, fueled even the same. Um, um same wars how they um they were deeply involved into the politics and in the warfare of the time and this is why i was saying to you that historically speaking this is a much more interesting period because the people who wrote the chronicles um of these cities were people who were involved into the political and military life of the cities while during the lordships times you have just the propaganda of the lord and no one really telling you precisely how it works. This is something that actually happens in, in many other times of history. If you take classical Greece, well, we know much more of, of, um, of classical Greece than to d of, of the Hellenistic age, because in the Hellenistic age there was just one guy at the top who was an emperor or a king, while in the classical age there came um, centuries before there were free citizens that could write, and in spite of the fact that they clashed against each other and, and killed them from day to night. Um, um, well, this is what is happening in Italy as well, and and um, the medieval historiography being even more advanced in terms of, uh, at least of actual recording, than the, an the ancient one, so that we know about these cities, mm, not all what we would like to know, unfortunately, but at least uh, a, a great deal of inform of very precious information that really are able to to show us an incredibly complex and incredibly incredibly dynamic world uh, into which these people uh, and this is what I, what I found most amazing is that they knew what to do. I mean, today uh, people um, seem to look at the world like with a dual mind like either bad on, um, bad or good, um, uh, right or wrong, um, uh, you know, uh, and all this stuff. These guys, back in the day, in the 13th century, were definitely more intelligent than us and being capable to assess political problems um, and military affairs in a much more uh, clear and pragmatic and intelligent view that definitely an average person over time uh, can do. So looking back at this scenario to me is extremely fascinating and I'm glad to introduce this um, uh, at the point. And you have to think also about uh, the, um, the, there would be in, in a Christian society um, also a, a great moral um, judgment, I mean, um, uh, or better, as I was saying before, these people remain remained pragmatic, um, even if they were moral in some way. If you take the mendicant orders that were preaching in the cities at the, in this very troubled time, um, uh, or this, the same mercantile class that was the one pushing for pacification because war created problems to trade and all. Um, even if everything was extremely more complex, because even the um, mendicant orders had people who came from um, uh, from the knightly classes or the merchant and the merchants um, also financed war, so you can understand how it's really complicated. However, they were still pushing for a general idea of peace, the idea that war wasn't uh, a name, wasn't. Uh, for the sake of it, but that there would be reasons uh, for for fighting these wars, and 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 there would be a, a general Christian um, ideal and utopia, especially at this point, to of pacificating the situation. I mean, if you read certain chronicles, you definitely uh, read sometimes the frustration, the disappointment, the um, 
the this disheartment um, of 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 these figures in seeing that uh, you know uh, that things really couldn't. It was very hard to make things work out well, uh, and that war was really a trouble, in spite of um, uh, in spite of the of you know the benefits of uh, of of the competition uh, and all. I mean, um, this is so deep and varied, and I can't properly um, simplify it, it this it with with a singular. Um, statement but uh, i i care about you understanding really what i what i what i mean so where did the the, the lords rise from we said that usually they came they were usually individuals but they could even be uh, a family that would obviously um aim to a sort of the dynastic uh evolution of this uh role but we're not really um at the um at, at the full stage of this because as we were saying these um signori were uh, or not even called them um calling them them this way because it was anti democratic uh, substantially from um from according to the popular rhetoric um would come from factions or families that had uh, quite of a consistent power mm -hmm. And they were basically profiting of the situation because if there were factions fighting against each other, mm, they could come to support one of the two to eventually share the cake w after having uh, knocked out the the other faction and um, triggering this process of, um, if you want, of of, of uh, social vert verticalization verticaliza of of uh, of the communes after all because if if this went out um you know just by fighting and taking out factions this meant that that basically uh fewer and fewer people would uh come at the top remain at the top and this was by the way accelerated also by the the cr the uh, economical crisis that was occurring at least in western europe um, during the second half of the 13th century we have the uh, probably the acme of the um, economical development but also the first signs of of uh, of stall at least the recession coming uh, w would come uh, more in the first years of the 14th century but at this time there was already you know the, the the biggest momentum especially in lombardy was lost so it would be obvious that as it uh, often happens into history when there is not more room for expansion whether it's territorial or economical financial or whatever you want to uh, focus on um the people who were there are going to have to clash against each other for taking what what it's uh, what it's limited there and this is what it started happening and um um at the beginning with with very varied uh, results um and um and it's interesting uh, from this point of view that the uh, lordships um um in communal Italy would remain based on uh the uh, urban centers i mean there were um, actually also quite large territorial constructions that still existed from those feudal mm, uh, lords that we were mentioning living in the mountains of the Apennines of the, or of the Alps and all that uh, already had those but this was the moment in which actually the um, the the communes were kind of eroding this because the communes were had been expanding at this point mostly in the countryside taking to to take out everyone who, who had who was dwelling in there in terms of lo of uh, autonomous uh, autonomous political entities including mm, peasant communities not just a feudal lords and like taking castles and all and creating something that was slowly getting towards uh, w what would have become the, the Italian regional state of the um, of the later centuries um, and, um, uh, and what is interesting with the rise of the lords is that uh, progressively the, the urban centers um, would transform themselves um, um, 
uh, from a poli on, on, on a political and institutional level to support these uh, lordships or better it was the same lords who at that point were imposing their own uh, rules uh, in the game and structuring the um, their uh, dominions around especially around the cities I say especially because most of these lords were kind of floating between as we were saying between the city and the countryside between the um, um, because the countryside and this is also I think it's interesting to stress the countryside uh, the land estate was arguably um, the base of any a form of political ruling but and in a certain sense they would be even safer um, not always but I'd say most of the times the, ci the cities however were a much more risky bet but they were they could e they could give in turn much more because of all the money that, that uh, revolved <laughs> around the city walls so um, it could easily happen that um, certain um, lords could rise over in that city at the beginning and then being ba bailed out um, uh, because they, they uh, the people was uh, still too strong for them to um, to impose uh, themselves on it um, uh, so the idea of having still landed estate outside outside the city walls in the countryside maybe in some uh, good mm, um, um, uh, valley of difficult access and all uh, was uh, still a good um, base even to a start from because um, um, eventually there would be uh, especially during the 14th centuries a, a lot of um, a lordships who came and went and paradoxically some of the guys that eventually made it to b create a lordship were the ones of that had remained silently in the countryside <laughs> and eventually pop out at the right moment even if they had more or less always been involved into these matters uh, telling the truth so uh, among the first uh, let's pass to see mm, uh, the the actual um, examples that I brought you today um, of, of lordship and um, they um, they um, I would start with Ezzelino, Ezzelino uh, from Romano or da Romano in Italian um, Ezzelino III also known as the terrible because he was seemingly a, a ferocious man but he was also a a, f um, a, f a fruit of the uh, quite sophisticated propaganda that existed at that time. Uh, Ezzelino being um, indeed a very stern, severe master, but um, being uh, criticized as, uh, as almost as an antichrist for many reasons. First of all, because he was tied to Frederick II of Owen so the Guelph chroniclers living in the popular cities, especially in, uh, in Padova, that uh, if you think about the the author uh, Rolandino uh, dei Passeggeri who wrote basically about him um, uh, his story and he um, he depicted Ezzelino as a monster substantially um, even if he uh, even as, uh, um, as a popular man or at least someone who was uh, from the from the wealth popular side he kind of respected this man um, because even the popular classes respected the, few, uh, the knightly class. I mean, they they were kind of proud. Even they w they wanted to imitate uh, these. Even when they were against them in the same city, they, they were kind of um, proud, um, civically speaking, to have these knights in, in their own city. You have to think that Europe was dominated by feudal and chivalric ideals. Uh, the people, especially, read uh, began to read, especially in Italy. They were very highly schooled and educated. They began to read all the French um, uh, chivalric uh, stories, uh, the courtly poetry and all, and and um, and they, they would appreciate and love uh, these uh, individuals even when they hated them, <laughs> because they they you you get admit that that a feudal knight was was a hell of a of a spectacle especially on the battlefield but not only even in urban society all the all the mm, f uh, feasts that were thrown thrown 
the Italians already at this time, especially <laughs> the, with their good weather and, and uh, lust for life, that they made this uh, gigantic, um, they would dine in the streets with all the tables and uh, uh, girls dancing and uh, boys um, um, doing um, tournaments and, and all. I mean, uh, the knights uh, even sometimes put the salt into uh, into the city life. They they showed wealth. They showed um, um, a model that was definitely admired. Uh, also because it was the model of, of very wealthy, powerful people, mm, just like today, uh, in many ways. And uh, talking about Ezzelino, we um, um, he um, uh, he basically rose to how did it rose to power? This is interesting. Uh, he um, he was born in 1194, um, and he uh, he was um, uh, uh, a peer of Frederick II in 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 this sense. They were born in the same year, um, and he subs he was a uh, he was a Ghibelline, and he sustained uh, the. Um, um, the, uh, the the emperor who allowed him to create a, um, a, a very extended personal uh, domain, um, and the the interesting aspect of this um, um, is that um, he he initially was um, siding with the Longbird League. I mean, uh, with the with the Guelphs in this sense, the ones who fought against the emperor. So for telling you even how opportunities could really work in this world, um, the Ezzelino has started uh, essentially as uh, from the, the fiefs that his father, Ezzelin II, had uh, given to him. Uh, he, he was from the uh, Trevisan Mark. The, the so-called Trevisan Mark wasn't, well wasn't really a mark, but it was called in this way. Uh, which is in the Veneto region, um, basically west of Venice, um, and um, and initially he immediately got involved with the um, with other um, 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 families, uh, especially the ones of Ferrara, and he d with their help, um, they uh, he kicked out uh, from the city of the of Verona the um, another rival family. And interestingly, Ezzelino became uh, a podesta of, of Verona. Um, so you see how even he uh, came not from a, um, you know, fr from nowhere, just as a feudal war uh, r lord. He he was eventually um, called to be a podesta of the city. Uh, at this time, he sided with Lombard League, um, but at a certain point, he, uh, for in local interests, he he went in attrition against it, and um, and he lost uh, the same uh, power in Verona, and that's when uh, the um, he sided with uh, Frederick II and he managed to recover the city of Verona. You you see how many uh, you know back and forth, how many, how much instability in this system. And um, the uh, and, and 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 at this point, the situation was still unstable. It kept being unstable until Frederick II sent to him certain troops that allowed him to consolidate his um, position, and he grew to become the absolute uh, lord of of the city. Other interesting thing, uh, which was definitely not at all. Um, um, rare among Italian nobility, given the importance that Italy had for the empire, he married the uh, the natural daughter of Frederick II, um, Selvaggia. I believe um, she was called really in Italian in this way, uh, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I'll just check it out. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't have time, but um, the uh, the most important thing at this point is uh, that Frederick entrusted, uh, began to entrust uh, Ezzelino with a lot of, um, a lot of other power, especially um, uh, opening to him the uh, Adige Valley that was vital for the contacts between the Trevisan Mark and Germany. 
Uh, why would Frederick do this? Well, obviously for having a loyal uh, Italian Ghibelline uh, lord in a very important strategic area, like the one that in fact controlled the passage of German troops from 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 um, across the Alps, and it could arrive into Italy and to support the emperor is in his campaigns. Um, and, and at this point, uh, Izzolino became um, a, f a, f uh, a full um, imperial um, uh, lord, and he wasn't much mm, really guided by fate toward Ghibellinism, but rather by the obvious um, desire to create uh, a personal domain, dominion, and and extend in it. Um, and he could do that uh, thanks to the imperial help on all the Guelph uh, opponents at this point. So he reached up to uh, Trento and the um, uh, Olio River and up to the Po River, so very large domain uh, in, uh, and also in the Trevisan Mark where he, he would remain more rooted anyway. Verona is in the Trevisan Mark. Um, and um, the uh, the Trevisan Mark, taking name from the city of Treviso, which was, however, mm, less powerful than Verona at this time. So Verona is w it was a bit of the main um, city, at least in a certain area of the Trevisan Mark, that um, in this sense was uh, conceived as a sort of unicum, uh, in spite of all the the natural complex political and territorial nature of um, uh, of, of of feudal um, Europe at this time um, and um, he he basically um, uh, lived off of this situation because he was r um, 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 uh, acceptably autonomous from imperial power um, and uh, the um, and and even w even when Frederick II died, he um, he managed to um, to keep uh, his power thanks to uh, even to the alliance with Alberto Pelavicino that we will be seeing in, in a short while that eventually contributed to his own downfall um, uh, at a point. But th they were uh, Ghibellines at this point. And Ezzelino, uh, in this sense, arose to be like uh, from the papal Guelph propaganda, like a monster that supported uh, the emperor who was the Antichrist, um, and all these uh, conception. Hence the the nickname the Terrible, even if he, you know, he he probably wasn't that different from from other lords or other. R rulers of, of the time. He was definitely a hell of a warrior, uh, a hell of a fighter. Um, you have to think that the, uh, um, the, the, the warfare dimension of Italy at this point was kind of still, uh, you know, the people had done a, a, g a big pro progress, but especially not, uh, and, and in this, um, uh, like the Travis and Mark, in these more f feudalized areas in a certain sense, uh, feudal warfare was still very, very alive, and the physical dimension of the fight, you know, having a leader, um, we know that uh, it was enough for Izzolino to, to, to stand on the battlefield to spread, to, to spread fear and terror to their own opponents for his um, um, military prowess, and he was, uh, he was a, a, a great fighter. Um, and um, he uh, he would die, as we will see, in also in uh, after a fight, um, and um, and so he was perceived like uh, a danger and a threat to the um, to the freedom of the popular communes of the wealth ones, and becoming a bit the epitome of the uh, of the damned. Um, of kind of the tragic hero in this sense, because he was not really a hero, as we said, but in in the mind of these Guelphs, um, um, he was still very praiseable for his individual skills. You know, there is also an, an historiographical tradition thinking about the Roman times at this time, 
that the Italians started already quite extensively, even in the middle classes, that was the Catalina. It was conceived as, you know, the, the famous um, attempted coup d'etat in Rome that eventually failed. And the Catalina was praised by the Romans because he was uh, beautiful, strong, intelligent, capable, but all um, um, qualities that he used to go against um, this is all ideologically built, of course, ag against the Roman Republic, so uh, a hero of evil I in this sense. Um, and, and Frederick, and excuse me, and Ezzelino was a bit of the same um, in, in, these, uh, in the chronicles of these Guelphs. Um, so he, he was excommunicated as well as uh, the uh, aider of the, uh, of, the uh, of the empire in, in Italy. Um, he was excommunicated by Innocent IV in 1254, um, and th there was even a crusade <laughs> that was uh, waged over him. He lost Trento um, and Padua as well. He he managed to he had managed to stand over Vicenza, Verona, and Padua, which were quite remarkable cities in the Trevisan Mark. Um, so w you see he that he began to 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 lose parts, and uh, um, these cities uh, kind of changing in their own uh, balance, and uh, he he couldn't really keep them. So at this point, the, the lordship is um, is still weak uh, in many ways. However, he had still the strength to conquer Brescia in 1258. Um, so a, a very um, energic man as well. Um, at a certain point he, however, entered in contrast with uh, Oberto Pelavicino uh, um, because he had attempted to extend his lordship over Milan, where uh, over which uh, uh, the Pelavicino had a s uh, consistent influence as well. Um, and um, he famously died um, after uh, the wounds rece uh, received at a battle of Cassano Dadda, that was one of um, um, he, he, his great defeat. He was wounded um, seemingly at a foot, uh, even if uh, sources are a bit. Think about septicemi. I mean, what, what was the medicine of the time? He was brought. Uh, uh, he was caught as prisoner uh, by the Guelph uh, forces, and basically he. Uh, he let himself die. He refused uh, medical treatment and even refused on the uh, on his um, death to reconcile with the church. Um, and in this sense, you don't have to really judge the person because even here, we don't really know how it really happened because these are 13th century um, chronicles we know these things from. But um, you have to think of of, of this uh, man uh, um, really probably being really um, disappointed even by the same role of the church. I mean, he was a Ghibelin, a pro-imperial, but this didn't mean at all that he wasn't a good Christian. In fact, we know that um, basically everyone uh, at the time was, um, if not a good Christian, at least a Christian in the first place. So. Um, the fact of not reconciling with the church that had been fighting with all, uh, you know, uh, its strengths against him, and having seen all the um, the military power of uh, of this uh, fort and uh, the hypocrisy the, mm, of the church, it was definitely um, uh, a lordship, a lordship in its own uh, regard, uh, probably might have led to, like, this is not my church. I believe in God, I'm a Christian, but what the church has done to me uh, has been done by people who, are, who shouldn't be there, who shouldn't be there in that place uh, in, um, in the clergy and all. So obviously the, the, pro the Guelph propaganda played consistently on, um, on his refusal as a proof of his terrible... Um, um soul that was uh, evil and wicked and uh, and all and, and all this stuff then before we pass to Berto Pelavicino I have to drink <laughs> thanks for for remaining here 
So now that we mentioned um, more than once Alberto Pelavicino, let's um, talk about him. Um, he, um, the the Pelavicino family, first of all, was uh, another uh, feudal family that um, um, stemmed from um, between the territories of Lombardy and Emilia today, even uh, if at the time uh, it was all Lombardy, you know, Lombardy at the time encompassed um, nominally Piedmont, even the Travis and Mark we were talking about before, Emilia, and also it was this <coughs> big uh, area that took the name from the core of the Longobard Kingdom in the Po Valley. And um, Alberto was, um, or Hubert, uh, as you want to call him, was the son of William, um, that, uh, that uh, uh, Pelavicino, who, um, who had been one of the, the great chiefs of the Ghibelline party in Lombardy. Um, so these were big names, uh, big families, and people who were uh, deeply involved into international politics, uh, even if from their tiny, relatively tiny possessions into Italy, they, they, they were, uh, I mean, tiny respectively to, I don't know, <laughs> the Kingdom of Germany or all these mm, powers that, however, couldn't really do without, uh, without these nobles for, for operating in, in Italy. Um, and um, they, um, and um, um, he he stemmed from uh, his family stemmed from um, f fiefs that um, I mean they had fiefs that um, extended in the area between Piacenza, Parma, and Cremona that are pretty close. They are bra basically gravitating all around the the Po River into this central area of the Po Valley, which was crucial for the passages um, through the Apennines, through the same Po Valley, from the region of Romagna to Lombardy. I mean, um, they were really in a, um, at a crossroad that had a very great uh, strategic uh, uh, strategical significance. And um, you have to think that we don't really know everything about these nobles. I mean, uh, we know when um, something about them more in detail when um, when especially the 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 chroniclers of of the time wrote the story of these people uh, or at least mm, what their role had been in in the particular city the chronicles usually being on a uh, city base or in the history of the cities otherwise all we know are um, documents that we can find in archives about uh, juridical matters of possessions of fiefs in the countryside and we don't really have a, a face of these people we don't really know much otherwise biographically speaking um, the uh, originally he um, he was um, one of the political leaders of um, the Guelph city of Alexandria and in 1224 uh, we find him at the head of the um, populars of Piacenza against the nobility that had been um, expelled by the city in, uh, um, in, uh, uh, in 1234. But uh, even just like we have seen uh, f uh, with Ezzelino, um, in 1238, he, he he was already siding with Frederick II, and uh, fighting um, the war against uh, with the emperor the, the 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 war against Brescia, and uh, and in fact uh, the year after we know that was created vicar imperial vicar um, in um, um, in an area that is called Lunigiana. Um, and uh, in a city uh, named Pontremoli. Now these areas are uh, extremely important because they are the connection between Lombardy and Tuscany. Uh, so this means that the emperor had trusted uh, Oberto to, mm, to be put in charge of, of those areas that are not far from his own um, uh, feudal estates. Um, uh, the Pelavicini had it having at this point on a local base very consistent um, territorial 
um, um, Dominion, uh, especially rather compact compared to other uh, feudal to other feudal dynasties. And uh, he um, um, he remained essentially very mm, faithful to Frederick. He he um, had many uh, roles. He covered many roles, thanks and for him. Um, he became Podesta in uh, the city of Reggio uh, in in Emilia, and uh, in uh, in Parma. Um, eventually, in 1250, when Frederick eventually died, um, um, then uh, he he even uh, managed to defeat the Parmesan uh, army uh, as Podesta of Cremona. Uh, and, and this was very important because the, the Parmesans had uh, managed to defeat Frederick II on, um, in, in, uh, in battle, or better, into, into the siege of their own city. Um, basically, Frederick had put Parma under siege and building um, a, a sort of an alter ego of, of the city of Parma named Victoria. So. Um, and, and the Parmesans kind of assaulted <laughs> Victoria and they destroyed the imperial army. And this happened after two years, so at least Oberto, uh, Frederick was dead at this point and the Owenstaufen in very deep trouble, so the world situation in Italy was turning pretty grim for, for the Ghibellines. Uh, but he at least by name kind of defeated the Parmesans, so he, um, he washed with uh, blood the the uh, fr from a Ghibelline point of view, the the defeat against uh, uh, that the emperor had suffered. And what is interesting, just like for uh, Ezzelino, is that when Frederick II died, uh, Umberto was so powerful that he um, managed to um, to to stand on his own foot, um, and he remained an imperial vicar. Um, even for Conrad IV of Weinstaufen, uh, to whom had sworn allegiance after that, uh, that the, uh, the Frederick II had died. Um, and even when Conrad IV died, he, and it would be just Conrad in, in Germany that could uh, resolve the situation, um, he, he basically kept using the imperial um, uh, authority. You have to think of these guys really going on with the imperial banners and claiming themselves rightfully the uh, the imperial vicars that had a, a very important political and juridical competence. Um, I mean, um, importance into into the Holy Roman Empire. I mean, theoretically, Italy had to be part of the um, of the empire, and uh, it, it had. Um, to have uh, its own imperial government, so these figures were really playing um, in with a double mask: the one of a local lord who was, uh, um, you know, operating at an essentially uh, prov provincial level, and at the same time mm, feeling interested uh, of the imperial. Mm, uh, of imperial duties in a certain sense in, in the absence of um, of the emperor of the physical absence of the emperor in Italy as mm -hmm. vicars and um, the mm, as we were saying he he became a friend with Ezzelino um, so they, they would be allied um, ag uh, allies against uh, the Guelphs um, and uh, he um, managed to extend his own personal lordship uh, as a podesta in Pavia, Cremona and Piacenza. So you understand how this um, power of his was floating just like the one of Ezzelino over uh, um, a city dominion, over the singular cities that however he could lose and regain and also. And especially the, the, the lordship of Oberto Pellavicino was uh, very extensionally large but you, in this sense, you have also to understand it was rather superficial. I mean, the, the local city could give him this mm, title, but first of all, he might be uh, physically elsewhere. So this was also a very clever thing to do for a city, because you say, okay, 
you, we place ourselves under the authority of this guy, but as long as he <laughs> remains away. And this was the usual thing. Then when the guy arrived in a singular city trying to draw resources, money and all, they kind of uh, started disliking him and wanted to to, to sneak away. Um, and this is uh, how it really worked, really. Um, and um, and um, and and the thing, um, as we were saying, um, went worse with um, uh, when uh, with with Zelino, Not even before Milan, um, the attempt of Zelino of extending his lordship over Milan. Also, because when Zelino uh, bought Brescia in 1258. Um, that was seen of a bit of a brush is close to Cremona, so the, the basically the the lordships of these two mm, individuals were kind of mm, getting too close to be devoid of attrition. Um, and uh, the um, and there would be also other mm, more inter um, more international reasons because Oberto lied himself with M Manfred the natural son of Frederick II that was ruling uh, on the Kingdom of Sicily at this time, while Manfred was uh, opposed to Ezzelina, so this was also um, another uh, point of, uh, of fracture, and um, um, he... Um, um, Alberto Pellavicino sided eventually also with um, Azzo d'Este, the Este were ruling in Ferrara and they were uh, bordering uh, with uh, the Trevisan mark, and uh, and therefore there would be a problem for it. And, you know, so w you see how the whole thing was evolving, and um, with his forces he contributed even to the state and the same defeat uh, and death of Ezzelino at the Battle of Cassano d'Adda. And um, mm, s uh, just like Ezzelino, uh, um, Oberto had been excommunicated by the Pope in 1254. Um, the accused was um, being a protector of, uh, of heretics, um, which was a pretty standard uh, thing. Like, the Pope didn't like you, fine. You, ha you are either an heretic or someone who is kind of um, siding with them. <laughs> um, there are the, 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 the trials in this sense are very interesting because um, we have the sources even of these things that they tell you how you know the most strange things were were brought up as evi evidence of or, or hints of, of being an, an erratic like uh, well I tell you other times um, but um, the mm, uh, he he was um, he was given the um, um, uh, the mm, he he refused to be absolved by these accusers uh, that were being offered to him even as um, in the bargaining process of the all these political gaming um, and um, he rose to an extremely powerful um, um, grade when the Torriani family um, uh, basically um, made him captain of Milan uh, for five years while he um, was recognized as lord in Brescia, Pavia, Piacenza, Alessandria, uh, Cremona and Tortona. So a huge domain that, s that stretches basically from from uh, uh, all across Lombardy to to Piedmont, um, the mm, the the Torriani um, uh, in this sense uh, had called um, the Torriani were um, traditionally wealth, but they had called him in Milan because they wanted to basically go against the uh, the Ghibelline exiles that had um, banned from Milan so to to put them against um, to put them against uh, Oberto so that they would drive the the two Ghibelline side uh, f uh, factions one against the other and also because Milan it was objectively very very big and difficult to control so it's not that Oberto would have a, a concrete um, 
mm, injurance in the Milanese affairs. So it's all this complicated, <laughs> believe me, and I'm making it terribly simple. Um, and um, and and relatively to the super, uh, you know, to the superficial nature of um, these. Um, uh, Pelavicino's lordship, we must say that when the uh, the Guelphs be began to kick in in Italy back with the arrival of Charles of Anjou in, into Italy and then with the conquest of the Kingdom of Sicily by the Angevins, um, Alberto was um, sent away from Milan and uh, he lost basically all possessions. He uh, remained um, entrenched in um, so-called um, Borgo San Donnino, which is today's um, uh, uh, that that was at the time um, a smaller commune, essentially um, uh, uh, close to Parma. So the the really the core of uh, close to in in the very core of, of the Palavicino uh, domains, um, and um, and and. Literally uh, losing every um, every other possession except uh, Fidenza. I mean, Fidenza being um, Borgo San Donnino. Uh, uh, it has a double name. It's the Fidenza. It's the modern name. Um, although the Palavicino would remain, this is an interesting note that uh, uh, when they were resized in their in their um, a, a core of origins, they they kept existing there and and keeping to play uh, the um, into the uh, Italian politics even way on the Renaissance and all. I mean, they these were all families that that basically started from here and eventually remained into the political game, even if resized uh, so drastically. And um, he um, and Oberto died in 1269 in, in another city near to his domains. And um, his, um, his dynasty living actually on, um, especially from one of his sons that had, um, mm, that generated um, important uh, dynasties. Now the third and last figure I want to talk to you about is instead William VII of Montferrat. Montferrat is this um, um, mark, uh, the time being a mark, today it's, uh, uh, it's just the, the historical name of the region, of um, an area of uh, today's Piedmont, really, um, and but still close and part of Lombardy in practice. And uh, he was son of um, um, of another. Uh, he was he would be the Marquis of Montferrat, and being son of his father, who was known as Boniface, the, uh, called the Giant. So even uh, I wouldn't um, n underestimate even the physical um, notes <laughs> on these guys, because um, you know waging w war and making back and forth from a city or another, fighting all the time. It was, these were old military men, you don't have to think of them as lords that lived in, in house, like, you know, being revered and doing n nothing in any long. These would be knights that were on horseback their whole life, essentially. Um, and enormous fighters, so even being uh, a giant, <laughs> physically speaking, maybe had its own um, its own in importance in, 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 in a fight in some way, or even just to be a leader, you know, uh, in, 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 a, in a war that re really required to, to go get, kill a person in, in looking at and in the face aside, unless you didn't have a crossbow, <laughs> then at this time was de definitely spreading quite fast, especially in northern Italy uh, as a weapon against cavalry, and it was in this sense a popular weapon. I mean, it was uh, very widespread bec um, in the popular classes because it was uh, easy to use, didn't require great um, um, training, and uh, it was pretty effective against the knightly cavalry. So he, um, the Montferrat, was also here um, um, a Ghibelline, um, a traditional Ghibelline land. 
uh, you see um, uh, how Ezzelino and Umberto were originally wealth in practice, but uh, siding with the Ghibellines. Here, the, the Montferrat dynasty had actually uh, a lot of international ties, and it would maintain uh, the Montferrat even um, um, uh, was uh, at a point even was even uh, inherited by the Palaiologo dynasty of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, they um, uh, they uh, the Montferrat was crucial in the balance uh, during the 12th century in Italy. Uh, um, uh, they um, when the, the they had been the Montferrat Marquis had been um, allied with with Frederick uh, Barbarossa. They had intermarried with even in the uh, mm, in the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Uh, I mean they had uh, a very mm, large mm, political range, um, scope range at least, and um, in this sense they, they were um, traditionally Ghibelline and very much involved into the political inter international policy, let's say. And, um, and William kept on with his Ghibelline um, tradition and he um, began to fight um, against the Angevins in Piedmont because the, uh, the, uh, the Angevins um, didn't just occupy uh, southern Italy with Charles I of Anjou, but they, they also entered in Piedmont. It was very highly fractioned among all these um, local feudal dynasties, not being particularly urbanized. And, um, uh, and he began to fight against the Angevins in there, and he allied himself uh, with Manfred when Charles of Anjou came uh, with waging the crusade against him. Um, and uh, William and Manfred uh, went on with his international relations, even marrying the daughter of the King Alfonso X of Castilla. And uh, um, and, uh, and and his first um, a wife had been uh, she she was dead now uh, um, Isabel of Gloucester so very international guys in here and um, and and um, the um, and the King Alphonse of Castilla at this point was um, very much involved into the imperial policy uh, he wanted to become emperor of the Holy Roman Empire there was a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, mm, fight in the in Germany during the imperial election, um, and and Alphonse believed in himself of being kind of um, of a Roman emperor, and that's what he wanted to be. Uh, the Castilians intervening in Italy partially, sending um, some forces in there that weren't really any absolutely not capable of dominating anything but really siding with these allies that the Castilians had in Italy. And Alfonso named um, uh, William um, vicar, imperial vicar, <laughs> in Italy. And um, he managed to break um, uh, with prolonged warfare the um, uh, Angevin uh, lordship in Piedmont. And um, it, and it's at this point that um, William began to extend his power into the area, um, coming to dominate in practice, even if um, in a very uh, heterogeneous form, um, uh, Piedmont and, and great part of Lombardy at this point. Uh, so um, you have to even to think about the juridical mm, aspects of all this. I mean. The medievals really went by law, um, or at least they they were uh, quite, um, you know, in this completely messy world, extremely fr politically fragmented and all. All they cared about was having a real center given by the, uh, you know, a, a right that was recognized to them. So. Once you had that right recognized, especially if it was recognized by the emperor, by a king, or someone who had the legal, um, the, the legal right to, to, to provide you with, with those uh, rights in the feudal world, you, you were safe. Um, and, 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 and these political constructions were extremely complicated in this sense because every single piece of er every fief, every city, every 
entity that you came to dominate had its own special prerogatives, juridical traditions, and also um, uh, also one note, one characteristics of these um, um, first lordships was the absolute uh, heterogeneity of their uh, organization. I mean, we, we, we conceive them as single lordships because from a political and military point of view, the, the, the weight of these guys was very heavy. Um, and, and their influence also very large, but uh, th the, the formal side being regulated um, mm, mm, basically all the times on a, on a local base according to um, um, an agreement with the singular um, uh, political entities and communities. So William had a very sad story because he was eventually captured um, by treason, by his enemies, and uh, w because this was co the, his power was causing enormous, um, enormous troubles to them, and he was uh, um, clo enclosed into a cage and he was let uh, dying essentially. So, yeah, this is how they did things back in the day. Um, even the Torriani with the Visconti and vice versa did something like that, now that we named them before. Um, so yeah, pretty harsh times and pretty um, pretty terrible days and all essentially for, for, for preserving a very few of this because you have to think that the especially the initial um, um, the initial um, signories in this sense were not perceived as now by the Lord like now now I will construct I will build up a very solid uh, domain and everything will remain as it is no they, they were perfectly aware of the uh, political game they knew that they could lose everything from a moment to another so in a certain sense the, the, ma the main thing was to cash fast and to add to your your domains especially uh, in in your home uh, in your in your fiefs uh so there would be also a lot of um riches and resources taken from the cities and uh, really invested somewhere else usually in war but also in aggrandizing maybe even uh, on a more rational territorial base, your uh, your lor your lordship around your fiefs that were usually, um, if not m you know more compact uh, than the city domains, because the city domains actually were they had a city that was a city district, so probably they were more compact, but they were much more difficult to maintain. Uh, while the fiefs uh, were much more scattered, but at least you could, it, it was your home. I mean, you, kn you knew how you could deal with them and you could hope of enlarging them and compacting and uh, filling all the um, all the holes in the, uh, into this very messy, um, territorially messy uh, ensemble and making it something more uh, strategically uh, effective. Um, however, I it is from these um, first course that uh, th these first uh, experiments of, of lordship that the um, the later lordships would sometimes derive, uh, and this would happen especially in the cities, in the sense that the cities uh, paradoxically were the the um, the half to which the the lordships were were being created. I mean, as we have seen, a lordship could fall quite easily, but the institutional uh, organization of cities, and especially their political and social balance, would be n compromised in a way that uh, it, it kind of started to grow dependent on these um, lordships. So you can see, for instance, with um, Verona, that was uh, the, uh, the center of Zelino's power, that the Ezzelini family that eventually um, survived uh, eventually intermarried with um, other locals, uh, local, uh, local families and especially with the Della Scala family that became famously um, the great Veronese lordship in the, um, uh, in, in from the end of the 13th and uh, the second half of the 13th and the 
uh, the beginning of the 14th century and that uh, in turn extended with a huge power much greater than the, that anybody has had ever seen in this sense into Italy always as imperial vicars a tradition that at that point was of, uh, had flowed into the into the Bernays um, political orientations as as a uh, kind of a substantial characteristic um, and really going on because the 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 De La Scala eventually got extinguished at the uh, at the dawn of the 15th century and and but and there are countless examples of uh, of lordships that kind of remained in there for a long time or that uh, however left um th th that uh were ex extinguished to to leave um a room for other uh um um lordships to 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 uh, to to to, in to come in there uh, we also named the este dynasty that uh, was one of the first also um, lordships we didn't talk about them today because they grew a bit more slowly but kind of more eradicated into the city of Ferrara uh, they they were actually the Este seemingly being had to mm, having had to have had um a greater noble an older noble origin they claimed if i'm not wrong that they descended fr even from the Ottonians and these were kind of made up um uh, genealogies but uh, at least uh, the the Este having really as far as we know some older and, and more feudal noble origins than the average and, and they developed in Ferrara and they made it to the to, to, to the modern age. I mean they they were one of the most uh important Italian uh lordships. Um yeah. So I talked a lot uh, even today. Um and I hope you enjoyed my video. I, I I care very much about these topics. I will definitely come back on the singular families, on the singular um uh, stories because i think they are important objectively and uh, they're not really told i mean people get intrigued by um by fantasy stories like uh, from from uh, mythical figures that are eventually fictionalized i mean here in in 13th century 14th century italy you have all you can ask for for any historical fiction to be actual not fiction but <laughs> real history all documented all beautiful all powerful all war battles and all and uh, nobody studies nobody learns about this because hey there is just the renaissance uh, and all the rest is not important this is this is what i call the complex of the giant i mean that people looking at the map of, of uh, medieval europe just focusing on the greater uh, political entities i mean the Italian lordships, as tiny as they could be, they were of extreme power, um, and they have to be studied because they are important. And the fact that there was not a kingdom there doesn't have to lead you. There was more than a kingdom there. <laughs> there was definitely many small kingdoms on their own that are definitely beautiful, fascinating, and uh, quite interesting to to learn about. So I thank you very much um, I, I, for, for listening to me. I, uh, if you like this video, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or uh, subscribe to my channel. And as always, uh, I thank you very much for your support. And I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.